Hello, welcome to our Bible study tonight. Uh, this is our first time ever redoing a Bible study. This last, this last week, the last lesson, we just had so many technicalities that we, we had to just delete it and start over. Plus, we're glad Joe's able to join us. Uh, Andy Powell might be able to join us later this evening. He's babysitting some grandbabies. And Ron and Rose are supposed to join us later, too. They were doing some church stuff and are coming in a little late. But uh, when they come in, we'll just go ahead and add them in the group like we normally do. Um, at this time, we would like to uh, introduce each person. Let's we'll start over here to the right and go to the left. And Leon also is going to tell you about our interactive activity as we do the Bible studies. Hi, my name is Leon Hart. I'm here in Franklin, Ohio, and uh, just looking forward to the study tonight. We will uh, try to monitor for comments and prayer requests tonight, even though at this point in time that's not functioning. <laughs> but we're working on it. And uh, uh, if you do have any comments, just post them on the YouTube channel, and we will make them known to everyone. Hi, I'm Jill Hart, Leon's wife, and uh, glad to be a part of the Bible study. Hi, I'm Joe Wilson, and I'm in Dayton, Ohio, and I'm just glad I made it tonight. So are we. Yes. Heather and Jacob. <laughs> what are we getting ready to do, Heather? Getting ready to travel. See you all over there in the States. Oh. <laughs> We've been very busy going over our checkoff list, haven't we? And of course, I'm David Ingram, and uh, we're excited about this Bible study tonight. It was a really good lesson. I think we had a really good preview last week, and now we get to get into it again. So I'm excited about the Bible study. We are preparing for furlough. So if you're watching this Bible study or you watch this after a while, uh, we are looking for opportunities uh, to share the ministry and speak at churches. So if you could contact us, that would be great. Of course, our webpage is newdaycm.org, and you can get all of our contact information from there. Okay, let's go ahead and begin the Bible study tonight with prayer. Um, Heather, could you open us in prayer? Sure. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your love and for your blessings. We thank you for your provisions. God, just please open up your word. Speak to our hearts, Lord, and um, help us to uh, grow together and grow closer to you, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. We'll go ahead and get started. All right. So uh, tonight's lesson uh, is titled, Committed to be Faithful. And as we learned uh, last week, anybody that happened to tune in to all of the breakings in and out there, it's uh, we're starting off with uh, Daniel. We're looking at Daniel and the life of Daniel. We finished up uh, Joseph, the life of Joseph here two weeks ago. And uh, this is the continuation of our uh, Jabez uh, prayer. This uh, section that we're in still is the Enlarge My Territory. And uh, after this section, we'll be hoping to um, that your hand would be with me, which has about 20 or so wonderful lessons uh, in that section, too. So we're excited about getting to that section. But for tonight, we are looking at Daniel. And uh, Daniel is a very uh, encouraging person and someone who, who I wanted to uh, be much like as a child so, or a young man. And uh, as we begin this study tonight, I want to ask our opening questions to get us kind of thinking about. Uh, we're just going to go from right to left, uh, each one answering the, th the thought questions. Uh, Jill, have you ever felt pressure to go against God's word by the people around you? Uh, unfortunately, I have to say yes. Not proud of it, but yes. Mm -hmm. Leon? Have I ever been pressured to? Yeah, have you ever yes. felt pressure to go against God's word by the people around you? Yes. Now, are we talking recently, uh, last year, last month, when you were a child, all of the above? What do you think, Joe? Have you ever felt pressured to go against God's word by the people around you? Uh, yeah, it's happened. It's not been recently, but it's happened before, yes. And 
And uh, Heather? Yes. Yeah. Several times throughout our ministry. Yeah. Several times throughout our ministry. Uh, I can remember coming to... Uh, well, of course, Joe's known me the longest, so... I had quite the reputation for a while before I became a Christian. And uh, when I and then uh, I became a Christian in the summer between 7th grade and 8th grade. So in 7th grade, I was quite the crazy person. <laughs> and then 8th eighth, eighth grade, I was quite the Bible pusher. So people weren't sure really how to respond to that. And I think people still today are kind of... Not sure how to respond to me. So. Let me ask you this, Jill. In what ways you said you had, everybody here said that they had, so I'm going to ask each one, in what ways? In what ways, Jill? In what ways? Um, catch me off guard here. Um. Uh. Well, listen, we'll, we'll, we'll catch Leon off guard. You okay. <laughs> Does the three-second rule apply here? <laughs> That's right. Go ahead, Leon. <laughs> well, I, I can remember times uh, when people at work would want to, you know, maybe go out to eat or something, but maybe it was a, a and this wasn't necessarily recently, but uh, might be somewhere they want to go where they're really more interested in drinking than eating. Um, also, a lot of times people mm -hmm. people try to encourage you to use language that you don't normally use just by trying to use it around you and, and get a reaction, things like that. So, I'd have to agree with that. Yes, yes. Okay, now that doesn't get you out of answering the question. Have to... Are you ready to answer, Jill? Or... Uh, I th I think this has been several years ago. Um, it was diversity related and um, in the business arena and there were some things that were said that that was trying to maneuver me to do a certain thing and uh, and I did uh, but I didn't feel good about it afterwards uh, I just knew I should have stood my ground and said no when you say diversity, what what do you mean exactly? Because I'm not really up to the lingo. I mean, what what is when you say diversity? What do you mean? Well, diversity in the workplace, if I can step in here, kind of means you you have to accept everything that comes across the board. Uh, it's a very politically correct word nowadays. Uh, I can give a, an example. When I was first saved, Jill and I worked at the same place, and I had to go through a diversity training. And in that diversity training, they gave an example of a of um, a guy that went into a carryout, paid for something, was given the wrong change back. He was given back more money than he paid with. And is it wrong for him to keep the money? Well, of course, I said, well, yeah, it's wrong. He should give it back. But you're encouraged to think from a diversity standpoint, you know, what you think is right may not be what he thinks is right in that situation. And to me, that was about as absurd as anything I could think of, you know. It was obvious it was wrong. <laughs> Moral relativism is that? There you go. Yeah, yeah, and it's also nowadays it includes every you know being accepting of every lifestyle, and it's not yes. just that you have to. I mean, it's one thing to treat people with respect, and there's that that is what we should do. It's something else to say I agree with what you're doing, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it when you don't feel that way. So that's where diversity is going. So okay, all right. Well, that's see because. I'm glad that you explained that because um, I'm not really up with all the lingo very well. So diversity, especially in a in a work situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate the explanation. Okay, Joe. In what ways? You said you felt pressure. In what ways? Uh, I just remember one time when I was a uh, youth pastor somewhere. Uh, there was a uh, evangelist that came in and uh, preached on the. Uh, importance of prayer and uh, it was around the same time of Halloween and Halloween fell on uh, Wednesday night prayer service and there was pressure to cancel the Wednesday night prayer service uh, because of the importance of being out there to hand out Halloween candy to the kids uh -huh. and uh, so the pressure was to take the importance off of 
prayer and put it on passing out candy, even though the evangelist just sat there and everybody was amen in the fact that you know he was preaching the importance of prayer, but yet they were so soon you know lured away by passing out candy that the importance of prayer fell by the wayside. Yeah, right. It kind of reminds me. It kind of reminds me uh, down in Kentucky when we were in college. Uh, if there, if we had church services that fell on a basketball day, like where Tennessee was playing UK or something, they were always wanting to cancel church. And uh, I'm like, I don't think so. You know, I don't really care about this this team or that team. Let's have church. You know, I'm here for Team Jesus. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, they would. They were hardcore, man. They wanted to cancel church services over uh, basketball games, you know. And uh, well, anyway, so uh, Heather's take care, Dick. So I will answer the question too. In what ways have you ever felt pressure to go against God's word by people around you, and in what ways? Hmm. Well, felt pressure. It's hard for me to feel pressure anymore, but because uh, I felt so much pressure in the past, <laughs> <laughs> I don't really care anymore. But uh, uh, yeah, so um, I can remember times where um, I'm trying to think of one particular example. Of course, you know the easiest one for me to think of is when people told me to go home and give up on God, that God would never use me again, mm -hmm. and. Um, well, and at the time, I felt a lot of pressure, you know, so much so that I considered ending my life, you know, one night. And, uh, of course, the Lord worked, worked through that and, and brought me through it. But, um, you know, i I got to say the most pressure I have ever felt to disobey God or not to obey God and serve His Word has been from within the church, you know, uh, when we were told, telling that we were going to Africa. People told me the craziest stuff, you know. They, they told me I would go and come back and kill everybody from an illness, or I would go there and get eaten by lions, or I would go there and the people would eat me, or I would I would go and get sick and die there. You know, there was all these, you know, things we should worry about. And, um, uh, of course, I went anyway, so... Um, I don't really think there's, a, you know, every time that I've been pressured not to obey God by people who thought it would be better to do whatever they thought that I should do, none of those things are ever a good ideal. And obey, obeying God was always a far better uh, option. Even though, i got to say at the time, I felt more, I felt like if I did do what they wanted to do, there would be some level of peace, you know, between us. But um, I think that piece comes at too high of a cost. So. Uh, of course, we already kind of mentioned this question. I'll, I'll ask it anyways. Uh, does it seem that the world at large does not want you to obey God? And um, we've already mentioned the diversity thing. Now that we are, you know, we all understand what it is. Uh, where... You know, can, can I add something to that, David? Sure. Um, just just to interject this on the diversity thing, I, I don't mean to say that that is all negative. There are other aspects of diversity that introduce you to things of different cultures and that sort of thing, and uh, um, those are all very positive aspects of it as well. So it's kind of a two-sided coin. So. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, I've never had diversity training or, you know, <laughs> Classes, diverse classes. I've had an ethics class in college, so uh, I had actually I had an ethics class, and then I, in uh, at Clear Creek Baptist Bible College, and at the same time I was taking a um, sociology class at St. Clair Community College, which was interesting because they were diametrically opposed. So I was taking I was taking one class that was telling me all this stuff is good. And then taking the other classes says all that stuff is bad, so it was an interesting uh, uh, quarter or semester. It was an interesting semester to take those classes. But anyways, um, 
you know, really, we could we could talk on this topic for quite a while. Uh, what about you, Joe? Does does it seem that the world does not want you to obey God? Seems that way only if you make it known that you are obeying God. As long as you're kind of off doing it on your own, which is almost impossible because obeying God means you're interacting with people. But uh -huh. as soon as it starts interfering with, you know, them, uh, that's when they get upset. Uh, I had one lady tell us, though, that, uh, you know, I didn't agree with what she said to me, but she said, you know, more Christians should be like you. You know, you kind of sit over here at your table and just uh, not bother anybody. And, uh, you know, that's the way it should be. And I was thinking, lady, that's that's not the way it should be. That's not what we do, but it's not what it should be. You know, so there, it seems like they're okay with it as long as it doesn't, you know, interfere with them. Mm -hmm. well, once it starts getting outside of... Well, what do you mean by interfere? Like, I, Well, as long as you don't start interfering with their ideas or their lives or you know, say something that they don't agree with, uh, you know, they're okay. Joe, I got an interesting activity for you if you want to bring it, if you want to try it. Next time you're in your Sunday school class, well, and Halloween's coming up. Uh -huh. Do an origins class on Halloween and Sunday school class, see how it goes over. Uh -huh. Let me know. <laughs> uh, might not go over so well. Go ahead, Heather. Does it seem that the world does not want you to obey God at times? I would say so. Yeah. You know, honestly, I think what I think, and I, you know, of course, the most of the people I deal with are Christians on Facebook or, or on emails or people who contact, people who phone call me, talk to uh, people I talk to on the phone. Now, I do have some pretty strong non-believers that I have a lot of conversation with too but um, one thing that I see is that the church has really gotten confused that what's the difference between being a believer and uh, being in the world you know this we have this blending of the world and the church so much so that the church is reflecting more of the world than it is of Christ and that causes a lot of confusion and a lot of hostility. So, and we know through Scripture that that's going to be increasing as we continue towards the return of the Lord. So, having a form of godliness but denying power. Uh, um, all right. Now we're going to get a little bit more personal. How about you in your own heart? Do you ever feel like it would be easier to just not serve God when you get around people that do not know him? We kind of touched on this with Joe. Jill, what do you think? I think from a carnal standpoint, you kind of think that, but when you get back to reality, uh, and reality meaning your, your, your Christian walk, you realize that that's impossible that that it's what you want to do is please God in your walk mm -hmm. Leon yeah I I mean I have had that feeling before and there there are times when it would be a lot easier uh, just not to make a stand for the Lord uh, especially if you just want to get along with everyone mm -hmm. and it's kind of like what Joe was talking about earlier quite honestly and what you just mentioned in the church so much of the world in the church and we you know we do we like to get along with everybody we like to have everybody come we like to increase our numbers and all that kind of thing but those don't mean as much if you're not really making a stand for the Lord and telling everybody what you should be telling them so it, it, it's uh, it's an easier uh, an easier path to walk but it really doesn't take you where you want to go I guess yeah. Yeah. Uh, Joe? Yeah, there's a time. So there's one thing I try to teach the people in my Sunday school class, and I say it not often, but as often as it does come up, you know, I say, you know, in the temporary, the wrong thing always seems like the easier thing to do in the temporary. Mm -hmm. But in the long run, the right thing is always the right thing to do. And in the end, it will be easier because the wrong thing eventually will become hard. Yeah. You know, it just takes time. Yeah. 
And then and, it gets uh, really hard. <laughs> then it gets really hard. So it's better to do the right thing yeah. in the beginning because it's the easier. Yeah. Yeah. The easier way in the long run. That's very good. Uh, Heather? Uh, yeah. Just to get along with everybody. Uh, everybody seems to have an opinion about what you should or should not do. So, um, yeah, I would say it would be, well, as Joe said, easier temporarily. Um, but then, you know, you're going to wake up one day and realize and look back that um, the temporary fix did not fix the, uh, the um, future aspect, the consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and also, there is a difference between liberty issues and sin issues. And... Uh, so if we have a weaker brother, of course we should prefer our weaker brother when it comes to liberty issues. But um, that's not really compromising to serve God. That uh, you know, that's just being mindful of the weaker brother. Now, do you feel how you decide to obey God influences the people around you? Does your obedience affect your obedience or lack of obedience affect those around you, Jill? Yo, we can't hear you. Are you muted? There you go. Yeah. Uh, ask the question again. Okay. The question is, do you uh, do you feel how you decide to obey God influences the people around you? Yes. A couple years ago, I can give a good example. Uh, the department that I was working in, uh, one of the ladies was big into these spiritual readers and advisors. And she knew one that did house parties. And she wanted to have a department uh, party uh, in and around this reader coming to her house. And we all come. And so she's making an invitation to the entire department. And she invited me. And I said, no, I, uh, that isn't anything that I want to be a part of. Uh, I, I, uh, God is against those things. And I just don't want to be a part of it. And when I thought back, I thought, well, I might have offended her the way I came across, but I was so surprised at her inviting me. And uh, the pressure was on, so to speak. Others would come by and say, you're not going to that party. You don't have to worry about that, that spiritual advisor stuff, you know, and just go on and on and on. There's no power in that. And so one day the lady who was hosting the party finally came to me, and she says, um, uh, and there were other other girls in the department that were going to attend standing by in the department. And she just kind of came right at me, you know, and um, she said, uh, Joe, are you going to come? And I said, don't plan for me to come. I will not be there. She says, well, you don't have to believe in those things. You don't even have to have her read, do a reading on you. And I, she said, there's no power in that. And I looked at her and I said, but Heather, that's the reason I'm not coming, because there is power in that. And it's an evil power. And if you want to release that <laughs> into all the people that's coming, that's fine. Uh, but as for me, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna come. As a result of me making that stand, half of the girls did not go. <laughs> mm -hmm and had planned to go. So I believe it made an impact. It made them to think about what they were submitting themselves to and realizing there is power in the devil's camp. <laughs> yeah, temporal. Temporal power. Mm-hmm. Uh, Leon. And the question is, again, can our, the way we behave impact people around us? Basically? Well, it's to the level that we obey God, does it impact those around okay. us? Yeah, and I would agree that it does. And, and again, you know, I think of the workplace and church because those are the two places I interact the most socially. But uh, I can remember things being said at church that, that would have you know, had an impact, something that, that I did or Jill and I did together. Somebody sends a card or something like that over something that you didn't even realize at the time had an impact on them where you were just trying to follow the Lord's guidance 
uh, at work a number of different times, and it can be it can be positive or negative from their viewpoint. It's kind of like what Joe was saying earlier about you know until it affects them personally. When people start being convicted, then you know that's a negative impact for them. Positive for us because we know what that can lead to. But and I definitely think it can. Okay, Joe. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I think so. And you know, I'll just go back to that story that I told about you know the youth pastor and. Uh, down south, uh, at the end of the service, I stood up and said, well, you know, based on what the evangelist said, shouldn't that mean we should make Wednesday night service, you know, back on? And uh, we, we, we did have service instead of, uh, you know, the members passing out the Halloween candy. And after that, people came by and thanked me for, you know, taking that stand. But you know, that's just something little. Yeah. Heather? Um, yeah, and I think, you know, it has a lot to apply to liberty issues as well, because, you know, I, I have made personal stands, and we have made personal stands in the past where they have been, you know, liberty things, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's not necessarily right or wrong to be involved in or to do, but uh, we have chosen not to do them, and it really has spoken to some people, and uh, they have, you know, said that, after we decided not to be involved with it or decided not to condone it, um, that it really made them stop and think twice about what they were involved in, kind of like what Jill shared. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've got a warm up here. We've we've kind of got the, we've set the stage for looking at Daniel. So we're going to start. Uh, we're going to get into the lesson now. So our background, we're, we're going to spend some time studying how God used Daniel and his friends to influence the Babylonians. Now at the, the time of Daniel, the Babylonians have conquered Jerusalem and they removed all of the valuables from the temple. The people of God are now under slavery and are being forced to become Babylonians. Daniel and the others are being trained to be good Babylonian citizens. And uh, Daniel and his friends and the young people of Daniel's age, the Babylonians chose them because of their uh, intelligence, their appeal, their strength, their youth, their vigor, their intelligent uh, or their um, their wisdom. And so these are the best, all the best and brightest of Jerusalem were taken to uh, Babylonian. Uh, schools and uh, prep schools and stuff like that to make them good, strong Babylonians. So, I'm going to start our reading at Daniel chapter 1. Uh, Heather, can you read 1 through 4? Daniel chapter 1, 1 through 4. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Aspenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the prophet. Okay, so what is happening in Daniel's life when, when we are for, first introduced to him? Joe, what's what's going on here in Daniel's life? Well, it seems like he's being taken out of his homeland and being assimilated into another culture. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He, he's, he's having to relearn everything that he's ever known, right? And I'm sure Babylonia was a lot different than where he was from. Now, who gave Judah to the Babylonians? Leon, who gave who gave Judah to the Babylonians, according to our text? According to the text, the Lord did. Yeah, the Lord did. Well, that's that's uh, that's not good. Now, why would the Lord do that? Uh, that would be because of disobedience on the part of the the uh, the people of Israel and Judah. Hmm. How how long were uh, how long were the uh, 
children of Israel here in captivity in Babylonia? How long did they stay? Is it 90 years? I believe it was 70. 70, 70 okay. Yeah. 70 years. And um, it was because they had been disobedient to God. So um, that's a long time, right? One generation, I guess, at least. Now, how do you think the people of Judah felt during this time? Jill, how do you think they felt? I believe they probably uh, felt forsaken of God, um, upset, distressed, depressed. <laughs> uh, but What's I that? have to think that maybe they realized that because of their disobedience, it brought about this judgment. Hmm. Heather, let me ask you this question, and we'll, we'll all think about it. Now, we know China has some pretty strict uh, rules. Now, how many, how many children are the Chinese allowed to have? Two. One. One. And what happens with that second, that second birth? Well, you either hide it, uh -huh. Or, you know, they're forced to abort it. They're forced to abort it. A lot of Chinese people are made sterile after they have their first child. That was why when they had the, um, you remember when those schools collapsed a few years ago and all those people lost their children? But when they lost their children, they lost all the children they were ever going to have, you know. That's why they were so angry. Now, how would you like being uh, Christians and you know honoring God wanting to have children and uh, producing godly offspring Heather how would you like if the Chinese came over and captured the United States and took everybody over to China to serve over there <laughs> um, I think I would kind of be a bit rebellious you'd, you'd have a hard time with it what about you uh, Jill <laughs> I, I don't think I would assimilate well. <laughs> what about you, Leon? Yeah, I'd be right there with her, unassimilating. <laughs> uh, Joe, what about you? Well, it depends on what kind of position they offer me, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've already had all the children you're interested in having anyway. Right. No, I think I'd fall in line with everybody else. I wouldn't deal too well with it. Uh, yeah. Well, see, the reason I bring up China is just because it's something modern that we could, you know, latch on to. The Babylonians had some pretty strict rules and really some flippant rules, you know, as we'll see later. That Their rules just kind of willy-nilly as they go along sometimes, you know, pretty extreme, too. So, um, but anyway, yeah. What do we know about Daniel so far in these first four verses? Uh, Heather, what do we know about Daniel in these first four, four verses? He had it all. He had looks and brains and physique. Yeah, like if there, you know, there's what is the girl's uh, beauty thing? I can't. Think. Uh, Miss America or whatever. Yeah. So if there was like a man's version of that, he'd probably been that guy, right? Sounds like it. Yeah. The description. Yeah, he'd have been in the. He had been competing for Miss Un Mister Universe or whatever. He'd have been smart and intelligent. He'd answer all those questions and not act look stupid when he answered them. <laughs> Somebody would have made fun of what he said, you know, and think, man, this guy's strong and attractive and intelligent, right? He'd have probably won if there was a male version of. Miss America. Yeah. Good thing we don't have that, right? So, anyway. What did his future look like in Babylon? From this four verses, what do you, what do we think his future was looking like, Joe? Well, you think he'd have a pretty good future because it says they were able to serve in the king's palace. So you can't get much better than that as far as worldly goes. But yeah, he's it going, sounds like a pretty good deal. Sounds like a pretty good deal for a young fit man, huh? I'd be like going uh, saying, okay, that's like us, the United States taking over uh, the Philippines, which we already did, but 
and then taking some poor little Filipino and putting him to work in the White House and you know being Obama's food taster or something. You know, It'd be a pretty good, pretty good gig, right? I'm sure that guy eats pretty good as long as his wife lets him. Uh, Daniel one five through seven. Uh, Joe, your turn, bud. Five through seven. Okay, it says, The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names, to Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Okay. Is that right? Is that it? Yeah, that's good. Now, how do you think the youth would have felt with this new privilege? Do you mean how, how like, these individuals? Because I know how the story goes, and I know how they felt about it. Yeah, but right at this 5 through 7. It sounds like a pretty good deal still. You know, you've got three meals a day from the king's table. So, you know, the king's not eating, you know, bologna sandwiches. I mean, he's eating good. Yeah, he's not eating bread and water, right? Right. He's eating steak and or whatever their meals were, but he's eating the best and the best, right? The best of the best. Uh, Leon, would you like that? Would you like that gig? Well, just based on those ser those verses right there, probably. I mean. Uh, it's a long-term thing. They're they're saying they're gonna they're going to prepare them for three years, so that's um, that's a time period where you know you're going to be well fed and well cared for, and you're going to have to assimilate in some way anyway. So they're going to be able to assimilate at a higher level and and uh, be able to be healthy and, and eat well. But uh, we know that's not how it turns out. But from these verses, yeah, it sounds pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, how have these guys been getting their food before this point? Uh, Heather, how, how, how were these people getting food before? Like these, like Daniel and his friends that came in from Israel. How, how did they get food before? They were of a lower class, so they'd been <laughs> like us. So how do we get food? We're responsible for getting our own food. We're responsible for getting our own food. We have to work or hunt or grow or have some kind of uh, process in getting the food, right? Now they just get everything handed to them. Uh, and um, what kind of education were they getting? Leon, what kind of education were they getting? Well, it says they were going to be, this is back up in verse 4, they were going to be uh, trained in uh, science and that sort of thing, but where is it in verse... Uh, uh, yeah, they were going to be taught the language as well, so they were actually getting, probably as they were being prepared to serve, they were getting the highest education possible so that they could actually be part of the culture. Yeah, so they're learning how to read, write, uh, mm -hmm. science. This is like going to like Harvard or Yale of their day, right? Mm -hmm. They're getting, you know, they're getting like Ivy League college education here. Tuition free too. Tuition free. I don't know, four hundred thousand dollar loan or something. They're gonna have to pay back now. Uh, Leon, can you read uh, eight through fourteen now? Sure. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. 
Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter, and proved them ten days. Okay. Now, what does Daniel decide to do here, uh, Joe? Well, it sounds like he decides to stand for his convictions concerning diet, at least, you know, defiling himself. Yeah, Daniel definitely has gone against the majority vote, right? Yeah, I'm wondering if, you know, what Meshach, you know, and Abednego and all the history said, you know, because they're part of this group, and Daniel's the only one talking at this point. Yeah. So I'm wondering if they're standing off in the back going, you know, Daniel, no, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> but or, or, just fully thinking, you know. Or yeah. maybe he just got the short end of the straw to be the one to speak up. Yeah, <laughs> like they pushed him forward. <laughs> yeah, but it'd be interesting to see what the other three were thinking. No, because they definitely end up being lumped, lumped together, you know. No. Yeah, Daniel decides to go against the majority vote. And w why did he do this? Well, because it said he didn't want to defile himself. Didn't want to defile himself. Okay. Now, how did he learn what would be defiling himself, Heather? Um, it had been passed down from his family. Yeah. His parents. So what's, what's that tell us about Daniel's parents or family? They did a very good job of um, raising, you know, purpose or raising with intentional purpose um, a child to honor the Lord. Yeah. Uh, Leon, if Daniel was your son, would you be proud of him at this moment? Yes, I would be for yeah. standing up for what's right. Mm -hmm. Even though it could cost them. Mm hmm. Now, you think that this was an easy thing for him to do? What do you think, Jill? Was this an easy thing for him to do? No, I don't. I I I don't think it was an easy thing for him to do. I mean, he's a human being just like the rest of us, and facing issues. and And, and this issue here is of paramount, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it, I think it was hard. I, I but. I think he knew his God and he was determined because it says in the scripture here that Daniel purposed in his heart. There's a big difference when you're when you're resigned to do a thing and he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. So he had already made up his mind that he was going to follow after God. And it it it, it sometimes you just uh, you have to purpose in your heart. Okay. Joe, uh, what do you think? Do you think this is an easy thing for him to do? Why or why not? I think it's a difficult thing for him to do. And because it, it, it says, you know, he resolved. So there, mm -hmm. there was something that he was going over. You know, there was like, it had to be a decision in his mind, and he weighed out the options. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. This is... Uh, of course, we don't have dietary laws now, you know, anymore. Uh, but this was uh, this was a big issue. Why was why was what he ate or did not eat? Why was that important, Leon? Well, there were there were things that were considered unclean for a Jewish person to eat mm -hmm. at this point in time, yeah. and he, he does seem to be determined about it too. I never really noticed this much before, but he actually goes if I'm reading this right, to two different people. Because he talks to uh, the the prince of the eunuchs, but then he also talks to uh, Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs has set over him. So he actually makes his request to two different people. He got, he's going up the chain of command there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll check with one, I'll check with the other. <laughs> I've never done that. No. <laughs> uh, who else made this commitment not to be defiled? Heather, who else made that commitment? Uh, let's, let's see back in the verse. Um. 
One of those guys. Yeah, well, yeah. One of those guys' names. Ananias, and Azariah. Ananias, Mishael, and Azariah. So they all were in the group. All four of them said, "Not I. I shall not eat, drink the wine, or eat the meat, the chickens." I don't think they could eat chickens, could they, Joe? Crocodile, probably not be eating no crocodile. Anything with a forked hoof. I don't think I'd miss the crocodile then. No. Um, now, did this decision affect anyone else besides Daniel and his friends? Leon, did this affect anybody else besides just these these guys? We actually, I think we discussed this a little bit last week, and this was kind of new to me, but I, I believe it was brought up that it actually did impact others that were there after they saw the impact that the change of diet had on on uh, uh, Daniel and his companions. Yeah, but right now, what in this in this passage here? Mm -hmm. These two guys that they've gone to. What was their concern? Oh, they were concerned for their lives, basically. Yes. If they if they made the a mistake with these four, the king would not be well pleased. Yeah, basically, they're like, uh, you're playing Russian roulette with my life here. Are you aware of that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joe, how would you like to have been in charge of the, these four guys? Yeah, I, uh, I don't think I'd like that. <laughs> It's like it's worse than falling asleep on the job, you know. Uh, these four get sick, you're in a lot of trouble. Hi, Ron and Rose. Can you hear us? Yeah, we're here. How about yourselves? Oh, we're good to see you. <laughs> well, we're glad you you're able to join us. We're we're looking at uh, Daniel. We're in uh, Daniel chapter one. And we've just been reading uh, Daniel chapter 1, 8 through 14. So if you want to, well, uh, we'll just back we're up. There. You got it? Daniel 1, 8 through 14. So we're, we're, ask, yeah. we're, we're asking questions on those verses right now. What are you asking? Well, I got lost. Hold on a second. All right, so now, what, right now, we just asked: Do you think it took? Uh, who was impacted by this decision of Daniel and his three friends not to eat of the king's meat and drink of the king's wine? Who who was affected by that decision? And we just said that the uh, two guys who were responsible for them, like the, the eunuch or the overseer, you know, if they got sick or died or something, it was his life at risk. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's where we're at right now. So do um, you think it took courage to make this stand for Daniel and the friends? What do you guys think? Did yeah, this definitely. Yeah. It took it took a lot of courage because you they were going against what they were being taught by the eunuch and the uh, captain and uh, and the official and uh, or the official and um, they could have been killed they could have been uh, you know probably they probably would have been killed if um, if the king had found out about it. They probably would have been killed. Yeah, it would have impacted um, Daniel, Hezariah, and Mishael, and Ezra, and uh, and uh, the other one. <laughs> I could have been his name. And Abednego. Would, Abednego. Uh, so I tend to have. I tend to tell. I tend to call them by their Hebrew names, not uh -huh. their Babylonian names. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's my tendency. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Well, we like to do that too. Uh, although I think we've been conditioned to remember the Babylonian names, you actually have to try a little harder to remember the Hebrew names because when you were growing up, 
you were always taught the Babylonian name. So, but I'm with you, Ron. That, and we talked about that last week. Although that lesson got deleted because we had so many problems. But yeah, we should name that. We should call them by their Hebrew names. Now, let's say this. Let's say that now they are. Uh, th this is a ten-day challenge, right? Is that was it ten days? Yes. Yeah. So, this is a 10-day challenge. Now you're on day two, and everybody's sitting there at the at the uh, table, and, and all the young men and, and women who've been cap taken captive, and they're all of his friends and relatives and young people are sitting around, and uh, him and uh, the three boys are just eating, drinking water and eating vegetables. What what kind of conversation do you think's taking a, a place around the dinner table? What do you think, Joe? What's it me? Did you say my name? Yeah. What What do you think? What kind of conversation do you think is taking place around the dinner table? Well, I mean, I would be looking at my steak and looking at their vegetables and thinking, you idiots, you know? <laughs> well, we've never had food this good before. <laughs> right. I, what, what were you thinking? Yeah. What do you think, Leon? What do you think they might have been talking about around the dinner table? Well, there were probably a lot of reactions. That would be one, certainly, of what are you thinking? And uh, maybe the thought that, uh, you know, theirs got taken away, mine might get taken away next, something like that. You know, if you don't know the full story of what's going on. Because it could be that not everyone knew that, that they had, he had actually asked for that consideration. So. Yeah. I'm sure eventually it got around when they were getting bread. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this: Everybody, who was everybody sitting around the table? Who were all these young people? Where did they come from? They were all slaves, right? Yeah, they were all. From the slaves. Where were they from? They were all Israelites, right? Yeah. They were all Hebrews. Now. Did God's rule about defilement apply only to Daniel and his three friends, or every person that had come out of uh, out of Israel? All of them. Yeah, all of them, right? All of them had gotten the same rules. So, is Daniel and his friends in the minority or the majority of people honoring God? Minority. Minority. There, yeah, there's four of them. They're definitely in a minority. Yeah, four of, you know, however many hundreds. And there's four of them saying, listen, we're going to do the right thing. Um, that's probably what got Israel into slavery to begin with. Don't you think? <laughs> Apparently some parents weren't raising godly offspring. Quite a majority of them were not, in fact. Now... You think that's an issue that we have today? Are we raising godly offspring? We need to take a look here and see um, the actual reason why Daniel did not want to eat from the king's table is because typically um, a portion of it was offered to idols before it was presented at the table. Mm -hmm. And so he did not want to defile his body and partake of the meat that would have been offered to the idols. Yeah. And so one of the things that I have written um, specifically by verse 8 is, um, you know, when you make a decision, stick to it. Yeah, that's true. And plus you had the dietary laws of the Old Testament that you had to apply, you know, they had to live by too. Right. So you have the, the dietary law and you have the uh, food offered to idols. Which that food offered to idols comes back in the Bible later too, doesn't it? Right. Uh, the thing is, is that, you know, um, David, once that decision was made, though, Daniel, I mean, Daniel, I don't want to say David, Daniel, once that decision was made, um, they brought him that type of food, and he didn't have to make a choice. It's not like there was, you know, cookies sitting right next to him that, you know, he could just grab up. You know, this was what was on his plate, this was served to him, this is what he was going to eat. Yeah, well, I would say he was eating with everybody else, though, so, uh, yeah, that, that was in front of him, but I'm sure it was, I don't think they... You know, it was all available there, you know. Um, I don't know if they fixed individual plates or not. Maybe they did. But, uh, but in any case, him and the three decided, listen, we're not going to do it. 
we're not going to do it. We're not going to defile ourselves in this way. And, um, of course, the eunuch, he was a bit uh, weary of this, wasn't he? He was not really. He said, listen, this is going to cost me a lot of life. I don't know if I should do this or not. But, apparently, because God's favor was with Daniel, he said, okay, well, we'll, we'll give you ten days. I guess he figured, you know, ten days I could probably fix it, you know. <laughs> hmm. yeah. So... Uh, how do you think the other youth treated Daniel and his friends? They admired him. They looked down on him. What do you guys think? Uh, Ron, what do you think? How did the uh, other youth from Israel, how do you think they treated Daniel and uh, his three friends? Well, if you'll notice, um, and you'll, you won't see this in Chapter 1. You won't see this until about Chapter 6. But um, I would say that Daniel and his and uh, his three friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were were kind of on the outs with everybody else. You were right. Um, the reason that uh, God allowed the Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, to invade Israel and drag off the uh, the princes of uh, of the tribe of Judah was was because of the way that uh, the people were. I mean, they were sinful, they were, they were um, disobedient, they were worshiping idols. So what happened is, is that what you got is, is I believe Daniel and his three friends were, were kind of on the outside. Now, the other men, the other boys who were men, I would say young teenagers who were involved in this probably didn't have much to do with them because they probably uh, were afraid to have something to do with them because they were not living the way they were. They were not eating the things they were. Uh, what, let's let me say this: if if uh, if you've been raised and you've grown up, or at some time in your life, maybe you wasn't raised, but at some time in your life, you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and then but then later you got away from obeying God. How, how did you respond to believers who were on fire, who were obedient and very zeal, you know, zealous for the Lord? How did you uh, behave around those folk? Did you go around those folk? Did you avoid them? Did you say anything to them? What do you think? What do you think, Joe? How do people yes. who are in dis... How do people who... Uh, have known God but are in disobedience, how do they respond to uh, believers who are being obedient? There's a little bit of uncomfortableness and um, somewhat of resentment. Mm -hmm. Who do you think you are? Kind yeah. of attitude. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, but I bet uneasiness is what, well, I mean, if I get it, huh? Uncomfortable, huh? Uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And maybe even jealousy. To a certain extent, I think I have found over the years that if a person is being willfully disobedient towards God, and they've known you as a, a teacher or a, a minister of some way, when they're being in when they're in rebellion against God, when they don't want to, let's say something's happened and they don't want to ask for forgiveness, or they, they you know they don't want to, or they want to go and drink or party or do whatever. They're not wanting to be obedient to God. Not only do, do they not pray and ask forgiveness, not only do they not want to read the Bible, but they don't want to be reminded that they need to be doing that. And quite frankly, you just serve as a reminder of what that they need to be doing. And that very often will cause people to be nervous or uncomfortable. And uh, I've had many a good friend disappear for a while. And come back later. I thought, well, he was friends. Well, we are. I just, you know, didn't want to be around him for a while. Uh, Daniel chapter 1, uh, 15 and 16. Uh, Jill, it's your turn to read, I believe. Daniel 1, 15 through 16. And at the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar 
took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. Mm. Gave them oh vegetables. Gave them vegetables. Yeah. Lentils and beans. <laughs> now how did God respond to their faithfulness? What was that again, Dave? How did, they how did God respond to uh, these four people, the, Daniel and the friends? How did God respond to their faithfulness? He gave them knowledge and understanding. Yeah, what else? <laughs> Joe, who were healthier and better nourished. They were yeah. they were healthier. They were better nourished. Yeah, Joe. Let's say it's it's uh, me and you, and you've been eating the king's meat and drinking the king's wine for ten days, and I've been abstaining. Which one of us is looking better? Well, now theoretically, it should be the guy who ate the meat. <laughs> but there is something to be said about body mass index. Oh. So, <laughs> I may look plumper, but you could look more fit because you have less body fat. That could be true. Of course, now culturally that changes too, you know. That's true. They might have seen you as a puny man, needed to bulk up a little, you know. So just, <laughs> Yeah, Depends nobody's on. Nobody's never said that to me, David. No, no. <laughs> so, uh, but we're just talking hypothetical here. If uh, Joe is the Israelite who just wants to drink up the king's wine and and eat the king's cupcakes, and I go the ten days without, you know, with being obedient, what does God super superimpose upon me? Strength, wisdom, knowledge, right? It's almost like that Popeye effect. Yeah, the spinning. <laughs> it's like the, the Popeye effect. All oh, ten days, and these guys are like cream of the cream of the crop, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Popeye. yeah. it's like eating the spinach of Popeye. All of a sudden, they're boom. Now, how did their commitment to God influence the people around them? Let's let's pretend we're at what's the buffet that's in Ohio where everybody eats? What's that? Golden Corral. Golden Corral. <laughs> let's pretend we're all now at Golden Corral. That's not just in Ohio. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. So let's just pretend we're at Golden Corral now. We're and there's the buffet. Now, Heather has made this commitment of no sugar. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> okay. So let's say that that goes on for 10 days and God honors it and then takes away all of our sugar. And we're at the Golden Corral. Now, how do you guys feel about that? Is this a self motivated question? <laughs> how do you feel? We're all eating at the Golden Corral here, but God has taken away all of the desserts and the cookies and everything. All the sodas. How do you feel about Heather's commitment now? What do you think, Leon? I think it would be fine for her and not so great for me. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I've never eaten at a Golden Corral. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's oh, like an all-you-can-eat buffet of apple pie or something. Yeah, I know what they are, but we've never eaten there. <laughs> you have no idea what you're missing. Yeah. Oh. Unless it's the one in Florida. Don't go to that one. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, Joe, how do you feel? What's... I'm not too happy at this point, but you're not too happy with Heather, no. the non-sugar, and like, uh, and and Rose, are you like really into chocolate? Most ladies are really into chocolate. I admit I have two major faults. One of them is Dr. Pepper, and one of them is chocolate. Neither of which you would be allowed to have. Now, how would you feel? If if the, the Lord took away your your Dr Pepper soda drink and all the chocolate dessert on the buffet, well, if God took it away, that would be one thing. But if Heather's taking it away, it might be another. <laughs> well, see, 
her commitment to no sugar for 10 days, then it, you, now, you know, it's crossed the board. You know. <laughs> well, if that's what God had in mind and that was his plan, then even though David's the, or Dan, Daniel's the one telling me, I would have to be obedient to what God wanted. Yeah. So you'd be like, you'd be like the three friends. You'd be okay. Yeah, yeah. If that's definitely from God. And then Joe, he's kind of like the the group. He's gonna, he's ready to rebel, right? Well, he's, Leon too. Leon too. He's, well, the the thing is, if if we weren't uh, looking at that in the first place, we probably aren't going to be really considering what God wants us to do now either. So. Yeah. You know. Well, you're already at the buffet, and then all this stuff's taken yeah. off. <laughs> <laughs> My sister is a cook at a restaurant, and part of their restaurant is a buffet. Uh -huh. And all through the all through her years of working in the restaurant, she uh, she worked at a buffet. And I got used to going to buffets because I would go um, uh, and eat, and our family would go and eat. And sometimes on Friday nights, I would see these people load their plates up. I mean, on Friday nights, it was always fish night. So it was all you could eat fish for one price. They would load their plates up. I mean, they would be it would be rounded with shrimp and and cod and catfish. And I always wondered how anybody could. They couldn't hardly move when they got done. <laughs> and you know, it's. I think that uh, Daniel was trying to teach him. Uh, was trying to teach not only. Um, his three friends, but also the uh, the um, unique and the official that we're going to follow God no matter what. And if that means we're going to eat less, then we need to eat less. I mean, personally, um, I'm trying to lose a little bit of weight, so what I'm doing is I'm not on a major diet. All I'm doing is eating smaller portions, and I've, I've lost some weight. But that's a commitment that I've made, um, you know. On the other hand, tonight we were at the we were at a little community fair, and guess what I ate? Cotton candy. Cotton candy. <laughs> now what's cotton candy? Sugar, sugar, puff sugar. Air. Pure <laughs> sugar. But yeah, pure sugar and puff air. Cotton yeah. sugar. <laughs> uh, so whatever weight I've whatever weight I've lost, I've probably gained a little bit of it back. Mm -hmm. But you know it's. It's it's a commitment, and I will. And you, when you look at Daniel and his three friends, even before they were carted off to Babylon, I wonder if they were not eating this kind of food already. You know, fruits and vegetables, and and um, um, healthier foods, and not so much um, the kind of meat that uh, the Babylonians were eating. Yeah. What do you all think? Well, it, it, we were talking about this earlier. That he had to have had godly uh, parents, godly family, godly, and that these commitments that they had made originated in the home, mm -hmm. and uh, had come, you know, from godly parents, and uh, which were apparently in the in the minority in Israel at that point, you know. So. Yeah, because they weren't supposed to be eating it in the first place. So really, for maybe Daniel and. His three friends, maybe it wasn't a matter of being tempted to eat the good, better food. I don't eat. know. I mean, you know, I'm thinking of a wife here that uh, wasn't allowed to have certain things. And then when she got married and was allowed to have those things, kind of went a little bit to get all those things, right? So I think if you're restricted from things, you're curious. You're curious and you, you want to go and get, you want to go splurge and. Well, I guess everybody's different, but I think if you hold back somebody, if it's not them, mm -hmm. if it's not their commitment, if it's your commitment for them, mm -hmm. and if it's not theirs, then when they get out, they get away, and, you know. Well, that just shows the wisdom of the parents, that they yeah. didn't, it wasn't something that was imposed upon their children, it was taught as something that they needed to accept for themselves. Yeah, they, they took it on as themselves. Uh, Ron, can you read this next passage? Uh, we're looking at 17 through 21. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, 
the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every, you said 21? Yeah. Okay. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters and his whole king, in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Okay. Now, what was the end result of their faithfulness to God at this point in their lives? What was ten the times end? wiser. Ten times what? Ten times wiser. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not only had they increased, increased in human wisdom, but what else had God blessed them with? What else had God, uh, Joe? What else had God given them? Uh, you mean like the understanding of dreams and visions? Is that what you're talking? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not only did they have human human wisdom, but they also had uh, increase in spiritual insight. Right? God had given them the ability to interpret dreams and to uh, understand visions. And so they had an increase in spiritual wisdom and knowledge as well, not just a, a carnal knowledge of wisdom. Uh, Leon, what can we learn from this? There are benefits to being obedient to God, even when it's not the easiest thing to do. Yeah. Uh, Heather, what do you think? What can we learn from this? Um, well, there are several different things to take away. Um, you know, the resolve to obey the Lord in whatever different situations you're presented with. And then also that, you know, if you're faithful to the Lord, uh, He's going to um, bless you. And then He's, you know, He's going to receive the glory that much more. Okay. Let me ask you this. What kind of person does it take to be used by God, Ron? A person who is willing, a person who wants to do it, and a person who will have... It's, it's just a person who's willing to do it. Look at yourselves. You're willing to be out in Puerto Rico. Why? Because you want to? <laughs> no, not always. <laughs> because you have to? No, not that either. No. It's because it's because it's because you're willing to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, willing to obey God wherever He wants to wants us to be. But just like it's not always the easy thing to do, definitely. And I, you know, honestly, you know, with us. Uh, this last three years have been really don't think that's going to reach mixture of blessings and mm -hmm. difficulties. So, um, uh, guys, yeah, uh, Rose is kind of beat and whipped, so she says she's saying good night to everybody. All right, good night, Rose. Good night. Yeah, she's got to get on her pump too. So um, we've had a busy, we, we had a rather long busy day. So she's kind of whipped, and she's got to get on her pump. And but she says goodbye, and she loves you all. Okay, we'll talk to you soon. Keep all right, going, well, Dave. all right. So uh, the question then was, now let's go back to the question: What kind of person does it take to be used by God? And uh, Ron says, well, it's a person who's willing to, to obey God, willing to do it. And uh, Joe, what do you think? What kind of person does it take to be used by God? Uh, there's one thing that the pastor of the church that I attend now, he always says, and he says our best ability is our availability when it comes to serving God. So I have to agree with Ron on this one that, uh, you know, God's just looking – to use people that mean business. I guess another way I've heard it is, you know, God does business with people that means business. So, you know, it's just the availability. It's it's not so much, you know, 
what degrees you have or, you know, things like that. It's, are you going to do it God's way? Yeah. Be available. The Bible says that God's eyes go to and fro looking for those he can show himself strong on their behalf. And uh, if, if you're not doing anything that would cause God to need to straw, show himself strong on your behalf, you're not going to see God do strong things, are you? I mean, uh, it doesn't really take much for God to encourage you to sit in the pew at church. You know, I, I don't think he really needs to... I think you can handle that one, right? But uh, if God has given you a God-sized task to do, then he's going he's gonna to come along and, and, and uh, give you the strength that you need to, to do it. I think a lot of the problem with uh, not seeing God move mightily in our lives is that we don't step out in such a way that he would need to or uh, be compelled to, you know what I mean? We like to stay in our comfort zones too much or what's comfortable to us. Um, let me ask you guys this. Are, uh, are you that kind of person? Are you the kind of person that we just described? Uh, Heather, you can go first. Um, Since I was looking at you. And... I try to be. I'm not, I haven't always been. Uh, so, but I think I'm, God is working on me in that. And, uh, I, yeah. It's not always easy. No, but I always, you know, I never want to get to a place where I tell God no. And I have told God no before. Really? When was that? Uh, when you, uh, when you told me that the next time that we went to Africa that me and my one and a half year old daughter would be going with you. Hmm. And, and you I said, said no? no? And how'd that work out? Well, we've been twice. <laughs> so. God, well, not only have we been twice, but God has really changed my heart about that. So. And and God really didn't use you in Africa, did He? Well, He works through me. Well, and, in, and and in what way? What happened? Well, um, there have been many salvations, and um, a testimony to the people, not only just the children that I worked with, but the uh, the adults. Now, uh, you have been and done two vacation Bible schools, is that correct? Yes. And in those vacation Bible schools, you put all the material together, right? Yes. And then you taught all of the teachers the material? Yes. And uh, the first time we had, I think, uh, 12. 12 children come to Christ. And this last time, how many was it? 25. 25. So 37 children came to Christ in the last two times that you uh, went to Africa. Now, what would have happened if you said no to God and stuck to it? Consequences. Unimaginable consequences, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, no doubt those those people would have had the opportunity to hear the gospel. But you would have had lost your opportunity to see all those young people come to Christ, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Saying no to God can be a pretty rough thing sometimes. Not only that, my heart would have been hardened just a little bit more yeah. each yeah. time. Okay, Joe, your turn. Are you that kind of person that we described earlier? I am hit and miss. You're That's getting there? Huh? What did you say? I, I said I'm hit and miss. Oh, you're hit and miss. Yeah. I'm more hit now than miss, but, you know. <laughs> Well, that sounds like the right direction then. Yeah. Well, you know, you always that. What is that phrase by uh, D. L. Moody? I think it was. Is that uh, where he says he heard a preacher say, you know, the world has never seen what God could do with one man that's totally sold out to Him, and then he said, I want to be that man. You know, that's kind of the attitude that I want to get at. I'm trying to get at. You know, I want to be that man. You know, uh, Joe, I probably should point out to you at this time that he did die penniless. Yeah. <laughs> I'm penniless now. What do I have to lose? <laughs> what do I have to lose? 
I, 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 uh, I always thought that was fascinating that D.L. Moody died penniless, you know. His ministry was successful, but he uh, he died a pauper. Um, but I like that quote from him too, Jim. Uh, Leon, are you that kind of person? Well, I think I'd probably follow the general consensus here. I try to be, and I think I'm getting better as I as I age chronologically and spiritually. Uh, but I've certainly had my moments where uh, failure was was uh, what I accomplished instead. But uh, getting better as I age. <laughs> uh, Jill, same question for you. I'd have to agree. As as I grow in the Lord, I I believe that I'm getting better realizing that our uh, our Christian service will never be maintained if we're sitting in the bleachers if we're a spectator we will never achieve Christian service and uh, we've got to be out there running the race and be a being a part of what God is doing uh, not only in our own lives, but in the church and around the world, uh, to have that focus and that mission for lost souls, and uh, it'll it won't be achieved in sitting in the bleachers. It just won't be. We got to be willing to get into the race. We got to be as um, Ron was saying that we have to. Uh, we we got to participate. We got to get involved and. Uh, if Heather would have stayed home, then the likelihood of children being saved wouldn't have taken place if she wanted to stay home. So, uh, to answer your question, I want to get better and better at it. Uh, Ron, before you answer, let me ask you a different question. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot. Yeah. Let me ask you a different question. Everybody's describing something that's very important in the Christian faith. They say that they, uh, in the past, have not been as obedient as they would like to. And as they are maturing in the faith, they are becoming more obedient and more like the person we described earlier. What is that called, Ron? I call it being a becoming a disciple. Because as we look at the opportunities and we see the opportunities and we follow what God wants us to do um, it means that we are becoming more aware of listening to God and um, and doing what he wants us to do um, I think that answered your question but I'm not sure well yeah that, Is that, that what you were looking for yeah no that's a really good answer you know we're to make disciples and we're you know to be uh, disciples. Um, also, um, sanctification, you know, it's the process of being set apart for God's use, you know, where we're growing and maturing in the faith and, uh, you know, it's it's what we like to call sanctification. So, But now, let me ask you this, Ron, are you that kind of person? What kind of, would you repeat the original question? Oh, the original, well, my goodness. <laughs> what kind of person does it take to be used by God is the first question. And then this, the follow-up question is, are you that kind of person? Let me ask you a little. little um, uh, it was when I responded to the call to go in the ministry. I was actually doing, you know, working for the city, raising a family, until I heard the call. I could have rejected the call. I could have told the Lord, I'm not doing that. <laughs> You're not putting me in the ministry. I refuse. I've seen too many pastors and I know too many pastors that have had that have had disastrous times. But there's something about the fact that when God wants you to do something, he's going to give you the strength, the ability the emotional strength and even the physical strength to be able to deal with whatever he's going to put in your path and the Holy Spirit gives us the power 
gives us the ability. He certainly has given me the power and the ability to do things I never would have experienced otherwise. I'll give you a short, short, brief explanation. Just last night, we were at the, I was at the fair. We were giving out brochures about our church. And this man walked up, and he called himself the high priest. And I asked him, the high priest of what? And then he said, I'm the high priest of my church. But out of the corner of my eye, I saw two men across the aisle listening to our conversation. I could have debated this man, but the Holy Spirit said, don't debate him. Give the gospel. Just talk about Jesus Christ and the cross. And because two men will be listening. I could have chose to debate this man. Now, he was weird, I have to admit. I think he was demon-possessed. Uh, I, I mean, I've come across some strange people at a fair. Uh, but uh, this man was, I would say, was demon-possessed. And But I listened to the Spirit. And although I was responding to the man, I was giving out the gospel to not only the man I was talking to, but the two other men who were listening off to one side. We have to be available. We have to listen. And we have to respond. I'm still working on it. I don't I'm not I'm not perfect at it myself. Just like all the rest of you, I'm I'm still working on it. I mean I'm not I'm not a I'm not there yet. I won't be there until I finally go home to be with the Lord. <laughs> but I'm working on it. I call myself a work I'm a, sometimes people don't like the phrase a work in progress, but I actually like that phrase because we are all a work in progress. You know, Ron, as I was listening to you uh, share your testimony there about this uh, witnessing with this high priest, um, when I preached the revival in Uganda in 2008, uh, me and Josh would go early, you know, to where the revival was going to be held that night. And we would go and speak to the people that were in the area there. And... Um, I was sitting there talking with a couple men. Now, in Uganda, if a person was Muslim, it was a dead giveaway because they dressed a certain way. You know, mm -hmm. they had the hat and they had the robe and they had, you know, they had their appeal. And so, there was no guessing if you're around Muslims because they all had a particular way of dressing, just like uh, Jewish people who wear the full garb and have the, you know, have the hair and the and the locks and all. And uh, so the Muslims there in Uganda would dress the part. Well, there was a Muslim young man, uh, probably in his early 20s, who kept asking me a lot of questions about Christianity and about how to become a believer. And I was answering all of his questions and, and sharing the gospel with him. And this man just continued to ask questions. Now... Uh, and he knew that we were going to be there that night for the revival. Now, there was this other Muslim young man that was next to him. He was his friend. And he was looking at me with the most evil scowl, you know. Like he just wanted to take my head off right then and there. Ooh. He just did not like the conversation that was taking place. Mm -hmm. Now, the ironic thing is the person who was asking all the questions, he did not come to the revival that night. But his friend, the one that was giving me the evil eye and just, you know, grunting and all, he came to the revival that night and accepted Christ as his Savior. Amen. Uh, you just never know how God's working in a person's heart, even when they're not speaking, you know. It's true. Yeah. And I didn't know until that night when the man came and gave his life to Christ. Um. Uh, uh, so we just never know, and and uh, what how God's going to use us if we'll be faithful. Now, um, let me ask this. This is a question that's uh, it's a little difficult question for us to answer, but it's the last one before we ask our normal one about how is God's going to use. What changes, if any, do you need to make to adjust? your life to what you have learned today about making a strong commitment to God. Are there any changes that you need to, to make 
so that you are a stronger, committed person to God. So we'll start with Heather and then go. Go ahead, babe. Uh, I think being more faithful and more committed in the little things, with things around, you know. Faithfully committed in the smaller things. Yeah, because it's easier to to realize the impact and the consequences of the larger decisions in life, as far as do we stay, do we go, do we go here, do we go there, do we do this, do we not do that, and those are pretty easy to to evaluate and to make decisions on. But when it comes to just the mundane and the little things, uh, I tend just to gloss over those and just go with the flow and not really, you know, make an effort. So I think I need to be more faithful in the little things. Uh, Joe, you need me to ask the question again or you got it? A lot of times, for me, it's uh, not really a choice between a, a good and a bad thing. It's a choice between a good and a better thing or the best thing. And I think that's where my struggle is the most is, uh, you know, there's a lot of good th things I could be doing out there. And if I don't prioritize, um, you know, the best things uh, that God would have me to do, um, I'll find myself, you know, putting those aside. Uh, Leon? This is kind of a tough one. I, I think uh, just because of some personal things that we're going through, uh, more more discernment. I need more discernment. And uh, I think the way to get that is just to spend more time in prayer and, and, and reading God's Word and uh, not relying on information I'm getting in other places. And that would give me the wisdom I need to make the right decisions. It was like a definite plan. Jill? I think what I see from it that I need to pull into my own life more and more is, is to put my trust in God more and more, depend upon Him, and know that when I purpose something in my heart that's what God wants, that He's going to see me through. He will always see me through. And I think that's the underlying thread in all of Daniel's life here is that in, even in this situation that we read about tonight was Daniel was putting his trust, he was putting his confidence in God and depending on Him. And that's what I want to do more. I, I, I want to depend upon Him and put my trust in Him. And I could do a better job of that. Believing that He is the God who's going to deliver. He's the God that's going to, to save and to heal and to do all these things. And, and as we go further into Daniel, we'll, we'll soon realize that God, that, that Daniel was believing in the provision God was going to take care of him. No matter what, whether it was in this first uh, issue here in the being brought into the king's court and the eating, he had to depend on God. God was his provision. That's what he was taught. Now all of a sudden he's in the king's court and the king's trying to provide for him. And now we see that that he is making that decision. God's my provider. God's going to take care of me. And so I think those are things that I, I want to learn more and bring into my life. Uh, Ron, what changes, if any, do you need to make to adjust your life to what you've learned today about making a stronger commitment to God? I think that as I look at what I do from day to day, Sometimes uh, um, I need to be I have a stronger commitment to stay close to the Lord um, and to trust Him more. I seem to um, uh, sometimes I um, I don't sometimes I don't trust Him as much as I should, 
And if I, when I look at Daniel, to you know, you know, he trusted the Lord. Obviously, even early on in his life, he trusted the Lord, and he really needed to trust the Lord when he was in the Babylonian court. Mm -hmm. Here we are, you know, in Ridge Farm, and we really have to trust the Lord to provide. And I'm still working on that sometimes. And I know that the Lord will, but sometimes knowing and and um, feeling it are two different things. Amen. Well, and, like, and like I said before, I'm still a work in progress. I, I'm uh, Paul. I, um, Paul was a work in progress too. He said, I, "You know, the things I do, I don't want to do, and the things I don't want to do, I do." Yeah. yeah. And. What a struggle. I believe Paul was a work in progress from from the day he accepted the Lord to the day he was beheaded. So we all need help and we all and you know, I need help too, so uh, this last week, um, you know, I, I kinda uh, you know, I, I think your faith kind of ebbs and flows like the waves, you know. You, whenever, you're doing really good for a long time, you know. You're obeying God. You, things are going okay. Um, when, when you're really put to the test, that's when you find out, you know, how much am I really trusting God, you know. When the things don't happen as immediate as, as you would like. And uh, I, I went through, uh, you know... If you think of the children of Israel, you know, they saw God do a miracle on every day that they were in the wilderness. Because every day that they ate the manna, they saw a miracle. They tasted a miracle, you know. They saw God's daily provision. And, and what happened after a while of daily provision? It became like the, the daily provision became the norm. God did a miracle every day in their life, and they eventually saw miracles as just normal, normal activity. And so much so that they started to complain about what? Miracle. They got. They started to complain about the miracle. I don't, this stuff is getting. I'm getting tired of the same tasting uh, wafer that comes down from heaven every day. Can we have some meat? Can we, you know, can we have some bird or some chicken or something? You know, something to go with this wafer. And when they got it, what did they do? Did they thank God for it? Did they honor God with it? They just they ate it, and a bunch of them died, right? If you ever, if anybody ever wants to know why do we pray for food, <laughs> here's a good example why you pray for your, your food, why you thank God for the food that you have, you know? So, anyways, they saw God's provision every day. But as soon as something didn't happen the way they thought it, it should, their feathers would get ruffled, right? I mean, the Bible says that their their shoes never wore out. Their clothes never went bad. They, they, ne they didn't need a seamstress because all their clothes was as good as when they left Egypt to go into the wilderness. And they had food all the time. And yet they, you know, they would grumble and complain against God, you know. And... Um, I had a uh, incident last week, this past week, where um, we our bills were past due. Our electric bill, our electric bill was past due, $170 bill past due. Our rent wasn't paid until like uh, the week, you know, a week after it was due or two weeks after it's due. Um, other bills were past due. I can't think of what they are right now. But anyways, a lot of a lot of bills were past due. We just didn't have any way to pay them. And um, but you know, like Ron says, we know in our heads that God's going to take care of us. You know, but it's that it's that trusting in your heart that's going to happen. And so I got to the point this past week where I had a crisis. <laughs> I had a bit of a crisis. We were at the um, Uh, just thinking about it, it's kind of getting to me. But we were at the uh, doctor's office. Both of our children needed to see the doctor. Uh, Jacob had a cough, 
had a, a watery cough we were concerned about. And Hannah needed to have her eye exam for the furlough. And we were there, and as we were at the doctor's office, we were like next two or three in line. We'd been sitting there half the day. And then the secretary calls us up and says, listen, your, your, your insurance has been canceled, you know. And, um, and I, which has happened before, and I've had, you know, and I, I had a workout where I, the doctor charges me 35 or $40 cash. If I don't have insurance, I just pay him cash. And so we've got a deal. The thing is, our, we didn't have any money in the bank. I couldn't pay him any cash, you know. And uh, I just, that was like the icing on the cake. Two months of pressure had been building up to that moment. And I'm like, dude, I, I couldn't even do anything but cry. I was just so tore up. And I'm like, God, I don't understand, you know. Uh, you said you'd provide. Where, where is it at? Because I'm not seeing it. And, uh. Now the kids can't even go to the doctor, you know. So I just checked out for a while, like a couple hours maybe. Two or three hours, I, you couldn't even talk to me. I just, all I, I was just sitting there having the best pity party I think I've ever had in my life. And uh, you just couldn't talk to me. Heather was just, and Heather has never seen me that way ever, have you? <laughs> I have never been that way. Heather didn't know what to do. Heather, Heather is like trying to fix everything and looking at me like, what is, what am I going to do with you? What's going on? And um, he's, he's sitting right there next to the insurance lady. She says, I didn't know what, yeah, I didn't know what to do. She's fixing the problem, you know. And I'm just, I'm teared up. I can't talk. I'm and the just, lady's giving me looks like, what's wrong with him? Are yeah. you going to say something? I was afraid any, if I said anything, I was just going to explode, you know. So, Heather, she talks with the girl. They weren't going to give the insurance for three months or something to process everything. And I'm like, well, that's great. You know, that's just wonderful. And, uh, but Heather, she stayed and fixed it, and everything got fixed, right? And the next day, and I posted on Facebook. I said, listen, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I'm just, I'm done, you know. And uh, that day that I didn't know it, but that day and then the next day. So that day, a gift for $120. Two gifts came in, $120. And the next day, a gift $200 came in. And all our bills, our past due bills, we were able to get caught up. Heather was able to get the, the thing. We went to the doctors. Uh, Jacob got a clean bill of health. And Heather got what she, Hannah got what she needed. And our doctor shared, you know, some testimony with us about how, you know, he felt that we were, he's really refreshed when we would come in, that we, we encouraged him. He really liked to see us and, you know, and he liked the way we, we, we saw medicine and stuff. But I tell you what, I had a, I had a bad day that day. I really did. I, I said, I, I, it's got to get better than this. You know, I've hit the bottom. It's got to get better than that. And we've been on the mission field for nine years now. No. Right? I'm not new to this. You know? I, I've had 32 cents in my checking account on multiple occasions, but one time in particular, we had 32, 32 cents in our account. And uh, so I understand, you know, that is the trust of the Lord. But that day, I, I had had all I could handle. So, you know, if you're like me and... You're just trying to serve the Lord and obey the Lord, and you have a bad day like that. You know what? The next day was a brighter new day, you know? And the Lord got me through it. So um, am I, you know, do I need to make some adjustments? Well, yeah. I need to trust the Lord better. I need to, uh, I need to be like uh, Daniel. And not pay attention to those lions in the lion den. You know, I need to be like Peter and not look at the waves and focus on God. I tell you what, I've been serving the Lord. Well, Joe, I'll tell you, uh, Joe was in our Bible study when I was in the ninth grade. 
I've been serving the Lord a long time. I should have this figured out. Are you Joseph still being? Yeah, confident? but uh, I got to tell you, I had my moment. So <laughs> uh, I think we all <laughs> we all need to grow and, and mature in the faith, and me included. And then Lord matured me through that and helped me to trust more. I had to come back later, you know. Say I'm learning still. Okay, let me ask you this. It's our last question. It's always our last question. Ron, how has God spoken to you today? Well, we... Um God has been speaking to me because we're getting, uh, as most of you know, you, we're getting our church is uh, you're coming to um, to Illinois to spend a month with uh, oh, oh four weeks or whatever, whatever, yeah, and, uh, with us. So the God, um, God has been telling me that to get our church ready. So I've been I'm going to be doing a, a little short little series. I'm taking a little vacation. I well, I used to, uh, word vacation is wrong, but the short uh, vacation from Ephesians. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've been talking. I've been. I'm gonna get our. I'm gonna get our church um, ready spiritually for your visit. And uh, so I've been. The Lord's been talking to me about getting our getting uh, prepared and being prepared. And um, my little incident last night with the high priest was just confirmation that that. Um, we need to be prepared, and so the Lord's been talking to me about being prepared for, for whatever He has in store, you know. And so I just uh, thank the Lord for that. Amen. Uh, Jill, how's God been speaking to you tonight through the Bible study? I I think that um, again it goes back to depending on Him, trusting in Him. And, and acknowledging the fact that he is God and he is in control and that he is the one that's going to take care of all our needs no matter where we are. But we have to be in a place and that's the place I want to be in that I'm depending on him and looking to him. And I, I want to be in that place where I'm trusting him more and more each and every day. Uh, Leon, how has God spoken to you today? It actually, in, in this lesson tonight, it actually comes down just to one word. <laughs> and that was back in uh, verse 8 where it says Daniel purposed yes. in his heart. That really stuck with me. I actually looked it up in the little dictionary here in Esword. And, and it actually says that as a verb, which is what it is in, in that verse, it means to have as one's intention or objective. So it was his objective not to defile himself. It was his objective to be obedient, in other words. And I, I know Ron asked the question earlier. I tend to think that he already did have the diet he was supposed to have before he ever got there, or else you know, he would not have asked for it again, especially. Uh, that, that just kind of makes sense to me. But um, to me, what that signifies is being spiritually prepared all the time for those things. When they do come up, you can respond right away because you've already purposed, you've prepared your heart more or less for that decision. It, there's a lot of Joseph in that as well, you know, but, <laughs> from the study of Joseph. But uh, it's just that one word that to make it my objective, and then you know that that implies that there's some activity on my part that's going to take place to prepare for that, to be able to accomplish that. Amen. Uh, Joe, how's God spoken to you tonight? Um, I think the way it's spoken to me tonight is back in verse 9 where it said that now God caused or had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. And I think it may go along with kind of what you were saying because you said that you kind of, it's like when you get into those situations where, you know, you, we kind of forget sometimes that God is at work and he's always at work and he's even at work before I make that decision to follow him and um, he's already providing for me and I forget that a lot of times so I think for me 
it's, you know, it's, it should be easier and more easier for me to be faithful to God now because I've seen him be faithful to me in the past when I had been faithful to him, even though it was difficult. But yet still I have that tendency in me to forget that God's already at work and he knows what I'm going to do and he's already provided for me at the end so that I'll come out bigger and better, but I still forget it. And so that's how it's spoken to me. Well, you know, not to be so forgetful. Yeah, exactly. I'm with you, Joe. I'm with you. I mean, seriously, I, I saw God give a woman a brand new tongue. You know? Uh, I've seen I've seen God uh, give give a, a baby. It only had the spine, you know, the uh, the little brain to give the baby a, a full brain. I mean, I've seen God do a miracle. I've seen I've seen God cure a lady of AIDS. You know, I've seen amazing miracles in my life with my own eyes. You know, and um, you know the the first man who who hadn't said a word in seven years and and asked me to pray for him, you know. And um, miracle after miracle, I could tell, I, you know, I could spend 20 minutes listing all the miracles. Uh, the lady that God uh, cured from blindness, you know. But, you know, uh, all of those went out the window when I was sitting there at the, uh, when I was sitting there at the doctor's office wondering how the kids were going to see the doctor, you know. All those things just went blank all of a sudden. And uh, I had a little bit of a, a crack, you know, and um, but the thing is, we need to be remind we need to remind ourselves in, in purpose, purpose to uh, be reminded that God is for us, and if God is for us, who can be against us, you know? And uh, but I'm like Joe, I forget sometimes, I and I need to be reminded. So I guess this week was my my week to be reminded. Heather, what about you, babe? Uh, two things. I think uh, what Leon said about purposing and um, being resolved. You know, I, I kind of thought every time, uh, you know, being ready. Um, you know, like a runner waiting for the gun to go off so you can start the race. Um, you know, I want to be like that. So that you know, I can be ready, and I can purpose in my heart to just shoot forward to um, to what you know God would want me to do, and just to be sensitive to um, any little mundane or any big thing. Um, I think I need to be better at um, you know opportunities and taking captive my thinking, and uh, just to purpose in my heart. So, and then you know, the second thing is um, I really admired. Uh, Daniel's parents and um, how he was able to take what his parents has taught him and how he has been raised and to apply it to one of the most um, you know paramount situations in his life you know and this wasn't even the biggest it was kind of like the uh, practice for what was going to come later on so you know he was faithful in just the small things so that he could be faithful in the big things. And I really, you know, I want to be that parent to Hannah and Jacob. That it's just not, well, that we're, you know, this is, this is what we're doing. Um, you know, not just in word, but also to apply it and to make it, you know, make it their own. I was thinking, I'm reminded of something Joe said earlier in the Bible study. We're talking about, you know, Daniel and and the three friends and uh, whether or not you know the three friends were up for Daniel you know you know maybe they were they were really ready for this challenge or you know they were going to do it but you know they maybe they weren't really crazy about it. but you know what Daniel uh, we don't hear much about Daniel in the next next big challenge it's just the three friends. So, whether or not they were, try, you know, they're pushing Daniel forward, or or he was leading them, the next time they're on their own, buddy, right? Yeah, the next challenge is theirs, and um, 
and we see how they do later. We'll see how they do later. But they're going to have to step it up themselves, right? And that reminds me that, you know, at some point we're going to have to step it up too. Maybe there's somebody in front of us that they take all the brunt, you know. They take the brunt, and we let them do that. But, you know, there's times in life where we have to step up and say, okay, uh, with or without them, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to obey God. So if I have that person to help me or not, here I go. You know, I'm trusting the Lord on my own. So Elisha had to come to that point, right? He followed Elijah around. And it finally came to the point where it was Elisha's turn to take over. And uh, the three friends here, they're going to have to step it up and trust the Lord. And I've seen people in my own life that that's way where they're content to be number two. They're content to follow. And to and God uses them in great ways to, you know, but they're, they're, they're trusting in this one other person to, to lead them or what, to carry them through. And at some point we all have to say, okay, it's my turn. I'm ready to go. You know, so uh, anything anybody else would like to share before we close? Any questions or comments? Anything you'd like to share before we end our Bible study tonight? Okay, having our three second rule passed, I'm going to say no. And uh, uh, Brother Ron, could you uh, please close us in prayer tonight? And then, of course, Remember, as a group, we're going to have our prayer time. Father, we want to thank you for allowing us to uh, come together. We praise you and thank you for who you are. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. Father, we, we pray that as we um, go along our life's journey and the path that you've chosen for us, we pray and ask that you just uh, bring us across those people that we need to talk to, minister to, and and, uh, and uh, uh, be able to um, serve. Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. We thank you for your example of Daniel and um, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. And Father, we just thank you for their example. And we thank you that, that you've given us that example for us to be able to look at, study, and to... Um, and to follow, Father, we pray that you'll just be with us as we go into our Bibles, as we go into our prayer time. That you will um, uh, be with us and help us to um, to pray for each other and to put forth the requests that you want us to. In Jesus' blessed name, Amen. Okay, so at this time we're going to end the broadcast. Hope to uh, see you guys next Monday night, and. Uh, uh, we should have a wonderful <laughs> follow-up study, and I'm pretty sure next week's lesson is on these three friends. So, Okay, well, we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye-bye.